Welcome, everybody. We are so happy to see you all here and uh, for everybody who will be watching the recording. Um, I say we, this is Susan Dutton. Hi. I'm Jamie Zimron. <clears throat> Excuse me, we are in Wisconsin. We're together, as you can see. Uh, and uh, so this is just a great opportunity. I am on the IKEA Extensions Board and recruited Susan, which I'm so happy. She's so fantastic. <laughs> and now uh, we had this idea for an Aiki author series to uh, speak with people who've written books about Aikido. And um, so this is our third Aiki authors interview. And we th there are links on YouTube if you just do Aiki authors. We've already interviewed Tim Spee Sensei, a book about Aikido and peace, and Kathy Park Sensei, who has been an Aikido solstice instructor as well, um, Aikido off the mat and bowing into Sensei glioblastoma. Today, we are really excited to talk with Lisa Klein Sensei, who is, um, well, Susan will introduce her, but I just want to say she's an Aikido Solstice Seminars co-founder, and we've been doing some really interesting seminars and also discussions and broaching topics that aren't necessarily always dealt with in the Aikido world or Aikido establishment, we might even say, and Lisa is the perfect sensei uh, slash renegade <laughs> slash mover shaker and so this should be a really interesting discussion and conversation we have some folks here from around the world so thank you all for being here susan i'm going to hand it over to you <laughs> <laughs> yes well welcome lisa we're really pleased that you could join us for this interview and um lisa is the uh chief instructor dojo cho of new haven aikikai in new haven Connecticut. New haven. uh she is a journalist and she has written two books already and has a third one coming up. And so Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, I've been um, a journalist all my life and discovered Aikido shortly after graduating college. And then Aikido sort of took over my career and that it took me in different places. And then I did the journalism when I got there, you know, including in Tokyo uh, where I know Myrna from where, um, I worked at the Asahi Evening News. I was in edit uh, in the uh, copy editing on the copy desk, and um, and then you know San Diego, of course, where I uh, trained with Chiba Sensei and graduated from his teacher training program, and just all around, and and eventually took me back to New Haven, where I started Aikido, and I started my own dojo about twelve years ago. So, and as I've been running my own dojo, I've also been sort of um, exploring how to bring them together, bring journalism and Aikido together. And I think, you know, there's a lot of untold stories in Aikido, and that's kind of been my mission the last few years is try to tell those stories and put, you know, put them together in some sort of easily digestible form, easily accessible form. So that's me. The first book you wrote was about Chiba Sensei, right? Yeah, that, that actually was an interesting because, you know, I was doing a lot of um, communications work for my organization, which was Chiba Sensei's organization at the time. And uh, when he died, we went to put together an obituary and realized that nobody really knew his whole life story. Nobody knew the correct dates. Nobody knew when he was where. And, you know, nobody had put it together in a journalistic way, which is trying to, you know, nail down the facts, get the documents, talk to, you know, talk to the people who were there. So that sort of got me, you know, thinking we've got to do this. A lot of people are getting old and, you know, passed to have passed away since and try to get some of these stories down. So my first goal was to do an oral history. But then as I was doing the oral history, I realized that there needed to be a, a structure to kind of hold it together. You know, it couldn't just be a series of people telling their stories. And considering that most of my interviews were about four to five hours long, which is, you know, a whole book in itself, you know, it really, it really needed someone to go in and uh, cut away and try to bring out the really important facts and stories. So that's how the first book came about. And the second book was just sort of fun. Um, We're going to talk about that in a minute. Let's stay yeah. with you, Chiba. Yeah, yeah. Your life-giving sword yeah. of Kazuo Chiba Sensei, yes? Yeah, that's why yeah. it's interesting you would use cut away because yeah. the <laughs> subtitle is... How do, yeah, the life-giving sword, yeah. Kazuo Chiba's life. But as an author, how do you go through all that material? 
it's a lot of time, you know, and, and um, that's part of the skills of being a journalist. It's not just writing, it's kind of listening and pulling out important facts. So, you know, to sit down with a five hour interview and listen to it and pull out, you know, maybe something people haven't heard before. I mean, maybe something uh, controversial, something interesting, something unusual. So, you know, and that was something I'd been doing for decades in Chiba Sensei's group and in the larger U.S. Aikido community is listening to these stories and kind of letting them settle in my mind. And then when it came time to write the book, it was about, you know, deciding, you know, putting these different stories together because they are, they are always different. You know, as I, I start the book talking about, you know, a very famous episode in Chiba Sensei's life and how it's come down in all these different forms. There's no one right form. But, uh, you know, luckily I was able to talk to some people who were there at the time at Hombu Dojo who could clarify. But, you know, but again, it's it's their point of view. So who knows if it's correct? So that's one thing you also learn as a journalist is that there's not one version of the truth. There's just people's perspectives and you have to make make allowance for that, you know, not not insist on facts when people are disputing, you know, have different perspectives. So yeah, that's how that came about. Can you tell me what is the life giving sword? Well, the life giving sword is a concept in traditional Japanese swordsmanship. It's actually the title of a, a book called the life giving sword. And um, there, it's just it goes back to some older writings in Japanese swordsmanship that talk about a death dealing sword and a life giving sword. So, it, you know, there's a lot of interpretation and historical background, but my, my, what I, cho what I chose to bring to the book was that for some people, violence or martial arts or conflict bring life, you know, that they somehow, you know, they cut through whatever, um, issues somebody may have in their past, whatever, you know, psychological burdens they might have, that there's something about martial arts. There's something about violence in, in some sense mm -hmm. that can keep someone whole. And that's actually the title of another book I'm, I'm, uh, or not the title, but the theme of another book I'm, I'm working on, which is about my own martial arts story and how, you know, martial arts can help kind of uh, work, you work through issues with violence. So, but that's, that's another book. That's book number four. All right. So, <laughs> well, it, just before we move on um, from your book about uh, Chiba, Sensei Shion, a lot of people, he's a controversial figure. Um, people have experienced violence training with him or that, you know, it was uh, dangerous or they got injured. And of course, he was an incredible Aikido and an incredible swords, uh, sword master. And kind of maybe you could share with us a little bit about um, your experiences training with him. And also, I'm sure you encounter people's ambivalence towards him. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just had some people come into my dojo a few months ago who were from the UK. And I'd say half the Aikido community in, in the UK have post-traumatic stress from Chiba Sensei's various um, shenanigans over there in the 60s and 70s. So, I mean, this is something that's really caused a lot of damage, a lot of uh, trauma to people over the years. And I mean, that's kind of why I want to write my fourth book is try to figure out why I stayed with him all those years and, and, you know, and what the legacy of that is going to be, you know, what the legacy of that is in the larger Aikido, com Aikido community, what's the legacy in, in, in my own training. And so, yeah, I think, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm not in any way making excuses for him. And there's a lot that didn't make it into the book, partly because, um, his family is still alive and, you know, his family was, had this, had the say, and they didn't ask me to, to pull anything back, but there were certain things that I did not include about his family life. Very, you know, because his family is alive. So I think, uh, you know, going into the personal life too much is perhaps crossing the line in a book like this, but who knows, maybe later on, you know, I, I should add the other information about his life. But yes, yeah, so as far as, you know, 
how why to to write about him in particular i think his life and his violence kind of gets to something very very fundamental in aikido and martial arts you know that we are doing a martial art and you know where does the line get drawn between a strong technique and you know injuring someone you know how does how does aggression work itself out on the mat and so i thought you know Again, I, I didn't want to shy away from his violence, but I also didn't want to make excuses for it. But I think, you know, inevitably just by featuring him in a book, I'm raising him up above t other teachers of his generation as an, as, a, as an example of some kind. So, yeah, it's something I'm still kind of working through, and I, I probably work through it more in my subsequent books especially my one that's coming up, which is about gender violence in Aikido. And I think, you know, certainly what I personally have witnessed in Chiba Sensei's dojo and other dojos, I think, uh, will be brought into that. I think, you know, it's time to have somewhat of a reckoning with these legacies um, of these teachers, which in, uh, sadly, in a lot of cases include uh, violence, discrimination, and other not very nice stuff so yeah that's i don't know if that do you have any other questions I about i want to honor you for tackling these issues um yeah well yeah. again it, it's you know i think Courageous. it comes by my journalistic instinct is that these stories aren't getting told you know in an open sense you know as a journalist i really feel like things should be out there for everyone not just people you know in in their room late at night at summer camp you know, t telling these stories, they, they should be out there for everyone. You know, and that's what what frustrated me about the Aikido community is that there's so many layers of secrecy around these these high level teachers, and I wanted to break that down a little bit. But I again, there's certainly more more that needs to be broken down, more more barriers. Well, you're really leading the way, I think, to doing that. Because as you say, people like say at a, a seminar, you know, you're off over here in your own room, like talking about it or yeah. um, things, you know, talking to your friend or ah, but to really bring these out, uh, these issues out into the open is, is so vital. And you're doing that through your writing. And I think, um, you know, in a way, uh, Aikido Solstice seminars of uh, the pandemic, uh, people mm -hmm. just really bringing their consciousness to to the traditional structures of Aikido and going, you know, there's a lot we love and value, but there's a lot that's kind of not okay. Um, I, I'm wondering how your writing, using your own writing, um, is helping you to process these issues. Well, yeah, one one interesting aspect is that after writing this book, pretty shortly afterward, I left Chiba Sensei's organization. I think partly because having documented all this trauma and drama and dysfunction um, in the larger Aikido community and, and, and in Chiba Sensei's own life, I saw it playing out in his organization. You know, I saw bullying and violence and elitism and weirdness and cultiness. And I just, I, I just left, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And I saw it being played out in, in subsequent generations and in, in my own students and in, in um, teachers of my generation. We're playing out this the same uh, psychodramas that I, I had written about. So it's like once I wrote the book, I was done with uh, all that bullshit, frankly. So um, <laughs> yeah, I left that or and I was independent for a couple of years, and then I, I found an organization that I thought was more more open and less um, haunted by this legacy and and these these negative um, patterns. So I don't know. I mean, it's still a new organization. Who knows? It could come out eventually, <laughs> you know, the same negative garbage. But um, again, I think I think um, making that break was really important after writing the book. You know, after immersing myself in this person's life, I felt, OK, I'm done. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's switch gears completely now and talk about your second book. Your novel. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's an Aikido novel, an action novel. Uh, I'm just so excited. I'm I'm getting it. I haven't even read it myself. I've read about it. I know about it. I'm so excited. The Demon Dojo. What a great name. So yeah. share well, with us I mean, about your novel, Aikido novel. 
again, that came out, you know, sort of in a period where once I wrote the other book, I felt like writing books wasn't that big a deal. And so I sat down and, you know, it's based on a, a former space that I rent, I rented in, um, in New Haven in an old factory. And it also draws on some of my, you know, experience living in dojos, being in Uchideshi shortly in New Haven for a very short time, because it was horrible. And, uh, and, um, you know, and just sort of trying to bring out uh, the experience of a younger person in Aikido. It's it's meant to be a young adult. The protagonist is 17. And, um, and you know, also just try to bring in some of the the experiences you'll have in a dojo in an, in an Uchideshi situation. So yeah, it's a little silly and, and there's a bit of cultural appropriation. So that's why I'm not too eager to promote it these days. But I, you know, again, people, kids in my dojo love it. Actually, people I know who don't even do Aikido like it. And I had um, I had somebody ask me, when's the sequel? <laughs> was, oh, shit. You know, and the, se the sequel, I set it up to have a sequel in Japan. So I'm going to have to go back to Japan and research that sequel and then write it off on my taxes. So <laughs> I had one question about it in the description. I mean, it's a thriller. It's a mystery. Uh, uh, there's a, the protagonist is a woman, which is great. Uh, you also mentioned paranormal activity. Can you say yeah. about that? What's that about? Well, that actually, uh, I'll credit, um, I, I'll credit uh, an old, a uh, senpai of mine, uh, Nobu Aseri in uh, California, who he he used to talk a lot in Aikido, um, in, in writing about Aikido and discussing Aikido about the collective unconscious, how, you know, we all kind of share this ancestral knowledge that we can tap into, like we can have access to O Sensei's technique. You know, we just have to, you know, configure our, our training the right way. So that is entirely Nobu Aseri's uh, idea that I kind of drafted on, you know, in, in this case, the collective unconscious becomes um, mythological figures from different cultures. So for example, the Japanese myth, you know, I have a Tengu in there, I have a Kappa. Tengu is like a mischievous uh, goblin, a Kappa is like a frog creature. You know, I have a, a Rokuro Kubi, which is a long-necked woman. Fortunately, a lot of Japanese mythological monsters are very, like, gender weird, you know, women, demon type, you know, jealous demon women craziness. But I, there's a little bit of that, but not too much. And, uh, yeah, and um, what's it? Yuki Ona, the snow woman. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, and then, and then I kind of picked and chose from other cultures. I brought in a golem from Jewish culture. And yeah, the golem. <laughs> so there's like a grab bag in there. I, I culturally appropriated on a very wide scale. <laughs> so. Well, I'm interested. Anybody else interested in reading that? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. so I, just like it. I can I can read it for free on my Kindle Unlimited. So that's yeah, yeah it's <laughs> on there. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's sold a few copies. I mean, again, pe people seem to really like it. And even people who don't know Aikido, I really tried to write it to be accessible to people who don't know Aikido. So yeah, well, it was just on that that point, I think that Aikido people, of which we are, are just hungry, thirsty to read about Aikido, uh, which is why we created the Aikido uh, Aiki author series. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's great. And also that we have books for non-Aikido people that because Aikido and from Aiki Extensions, right, mm -hmm. uh, has so many applications in our lives and, and is relevant to people in general. We're yeah. going to ask a little bit about your current book, and then we will open up for questions. And yeah. if you want to make any comments or anything, uh, you know, in the chat, you can. But uh, let's uh, go on to your last yeah. book. So I think it, this one is going to be my most important book, at least to me. I mean, it's it's called Fallen, the USAF's Culture of Gender Violence and a Path Forward for Aikido. So it very much focuses, and again, uh, for those of you who aren't American, the USAF is the largest Aikido organization in the United States. Um, it's certainly not uh, overwhelmingly dominant in terms of active dojos right now. I think there are a lot of really um, strong organizations on the West Coast. Um, there's strong organizations in the Midwest. And um, the, the USAF grew to a certain point now. I think it's contracting uh, because Yamada Sensei died uh, this year. But I think uh, for many years, it was uh, 
pretty dominant, especially here on the East Coast. And it really has a, a sad history of kind of um, gender discrimination. It really sidelined women. Um, I always, I, I grew up and started Aikido on the East Coast at a certain point. And I was training in a USAF dojo when I got pretty serious about Aikido. And I went up to the headquarters dojo of the USAF and it was like a frat house. You know, the, the male teachers were bragging about bringing women and doing them on the mat in the main dojo. And it was just very clear that there was no space for, for women um, to rise up uh, organically in the organization, you know, at, at a higher, at, at a more intense level. So, um, and again, you know, I, I saw that I, I opted for Chiba Sensei's organization instead, which had, you know, of course had its own issues, but gender discrimination <laughs> on a mass scale was not one of them. And um, so I, I really uh, kind of ignored what was going on in the USAF for many years. And then when I moved back to the US to, to the East Coast, I really realized um, how dominant it was, how, again, toxic gender dynamics. I saw them, I would go pretty frequently to their camps and see see it up close, see how how oppressed a lot of the women felt, how um, how little voice they had, how how um, how many kind of victimizations were happening behind the scenes. I mean, and and the book opens with me in a hotel room at USAF camp, hearing from a lot of senior women of these just horrific stories of, you know, being groped on the mat. And, and you know, and these are women, unfortunately, who then turned around and supported the USAF in a later scandal. But again, so there, there are all these issues in the USAF percolating over the years. They came out uh, a few years back in a petition um, situation, which I know Janice knows quite a bit about. But yeah, so again, this this, this is some this is like a a, a relatively new um, issue or new issue that came out into the larger Aikido community. So I think again, as a journalist, this is a story I wanted to tell and highlight um, the experience of a lot of these women and my own experience and um, say, you know, and again, kind of dovetailing, I'm certainly not going to leave out other organizations in this book because there are really horrific situations that have happened in California with Bruce Clickstein and in the Midwest. So um, I, I really want to dive into some of this uh, gender gender disparity that's been going on in Aikido and also um, just tell the stories, you know, tell the stories of what's happened to people and then look ahead. What can we do? How can we how can we move past this le these legacies, not only of Yamada Sensei, but also of Chiba Sensei? How can we move past uh, this really dysfunctional stuff that's keeping Aikido uh, in the dark ages? So that's sort of an outline of the book. Um, I'm still working on it diligently behind the scenes, but I've still got a lot of work to do. I'm hoping to get out in the fall uh, in time for women's camp. Mm. So that's my goal. Um, before we open to questions, I have one other question, and that is you are definitely tackling very controversial, in fact, taboo in topics and bringing out stories, information. A lot of people haven't spoken up because it's, you can get um, blackballed, basically. <laughs> um, that's the right word. You can get uh, you know, not promoted, you can get ostracized, you can suffer consequences for challenging. Yeah. Some I, I, I was banned problems. from a seminar a couple of years ago because I was just, you know, discussing these issues on, on, uh, on social media. I was told I was not welcome at a seminar. Okay. So where do you find the strength of the courage um, to, to not only speak up, to, but to really write and write books about these topics and to be bringing them to the fore in, in the Aikido world? Well, again, I think, you know, journalists are kind of a special breed. We, we like to tell stories and we, and we really don't give a fuck what people think. <laughs> you know? it's like, you know, if, you, if you give a fuck what people think, you won't try to upset anyone. And that's, you know, and unfortunately, you know, that's what they say about journalists. We, we comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in, in the case of the USAF, this is an organization that's very comfortable with its legacy, very comfortable with its leadership, 
They think everything's great and, oh, that didn't happen in my dojo, so it's not a big deal, you know? And, and I think it's important, again, we get back to the life-giving sword. I mean, Aikido should not be, you know, all fun and games and smiles and pats on the back. You know, there's there's sometimes a sword that just cuts through what you're doing. You know, you you got to you got to come back to reality. And I think the USAF really really needs a sword to come through. And you know, and again, I'm not trying to change anything. The USAF that that's their their deal, their leadership, whatever. But I think the stories of the people who've been impacted by their decisions and their their dysfunctional behavior need to be heard and need to be heard in a in a cohesive fashion where people can see how this has progressed over the years the different uh situations have can all be put together and then also the other um equivalent situations in other groups that have have really reflected again a culture of secrecy a culture of hierarchy of oppressive hierarchy and a culture of uh of denial so i think that's my hope is that this will kind of cut through some of the bullshit that's been out there nationwide worldwide about um how aikido or organizations operate and how martial arts i mean i'm certainly not uh aikido certainly not alone but i think it's I like it's, that. it's, that's it's so it's you really it's so you to um cut through the bullshit not giving a fuck <laughs> that's pretty great um thank you for you know really for your uh, all the work you do in, in the role that you play in doing that and, and having that kind of you know fearlessness and, and sharp sword um anybody want to ask a question or uh, just unmute yourself crystal I, I actually have i think two questions but they might be together so your latest book who's the youngest story or person or a reference in that because the follow-up question is how much is this in is within an organization regardless of which organization um and how much of this is just a generational thing that now we're sort of addressing because of the time so like a couple of years ago they said aikido was aging how much of this is a the generations now being looked at because there are younger people more empowered people and youth um being yeah, added sorry. to this mix Sorry, I didn't hear the first question very well. What was what was well, the first question? Who is the like youngest? Because you made a reference to your your latest book. You're gonna you're telling stories about women who you know met not great things going on. Who's like the youngest? Like, is it like in their thirties, their twenties? We talking fifties, oh, yeah. sixties? Oh no, you know, I that's mean just the best question. I think you know. definitely that the bulk of the stories are from the USAF's classical era which would probably be sure. uh, you know this this the 80s and 90s okay. but there are some women in their 20s there are you know some pretty recent experiences and i think okay. as far as generational change you know and that's one thing i saw in birinkai because mm -hmm. birinkai you know th that's chiba sensei's organization mm -hmm. is that you're seeing these these same um negative patterns being reproduced in younger teachers so that's wow. what that's what kind of horrified me is that, you know, it's not just the generations, actually the generations that interacted the most with Chiba Sensei, I think have a much clearer view of, mm. for, of the positives and negatives, but it's the next, the next generations that maybe were at a distance were mm. free to kind of mythologized and, you know, make, make, you know, hero worship. And, you know, they didn't have to see up close a lot of the collateral damage caused by um, sure. these extreme behaviors and i think it's probably same the true the same thing is true in the usaf the generations mm -hmm. that have dealt that dealt directly with Chi, with uh, yamada sensei and his senior teachers probably have a little less um fewer illusions than the, mm -hmm. the next generation they're they're going to be the ones who are going to really be like we've got nothing wrong in usaf it's a paradise mm -hmm. for women you know <laughs> yamada sensei loves so women mm -hmm. yeah so, so my my the next parallel on this is that so I for me personally I view um, teacher student relationship lot mirrors a parenting relationship like parent to child and so one of the things in my generation is we're stopping the habits our parents picked up that they got from their parents that got from their parents do you find that you see the same parallel in Aikido? No, I see. There are I some see, people who I are see. stopping and some people are going. Yeah, I see younger generations trying to emulate the worst of the older generations. Okay. And uh, and sad. I'm sad to say that. I mean, I think the people who who don't emulate it maybe leave. 
you know, and do something else. But well, I think part left, of the tradition left, in Aikido is to emulate your teachers and then you finally get to positions of power and the questioning, examining and saying this isn't okay and creating new paths forward is really important. And your voice is a leading one in that. And, um, you know, others here, it, it, we all need to be doing that together as a community um, so that oh, yeah. we don't just emulate the worst of the past. We bring forward the good stuff, but we, we chart some new ways forward. Yeah. And I, and I think that's partly the purpose of the book. Like, you know, you can't be in denial about what happened in the USAF situation. If you have a whole text in front of you that outlines it and and tells you the collateral damage that came about from from these decisions so mm -hmm. that's my hope is that this will hopefully help some people break the cycle i don't think you know again there's always going to be a hardcore taliban uh faction of, of these groups but yeah i'm hoping that the some of the more but then you know i guess you can never uh never win by betting against the taliban yeah claire <laughs> Hi, um, hi, Lisa. Hi. Anna's phone died, but you forgot to introduce her as a founder of the seminar. So, God mentioned Janice. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, anyway, my question, you know, I'm going to make a little statement, which is that I don't think you can reform the police department from within the police department. I don't think you can reform the USAF ever because it's a cult. And so therefore anything is, uh, anything goes, you know? And in terms of Aikido practice, in my experience, there hasn't been a lot of encouragement for people to do what they do well to develop their own Aikido. It's always from the outside in rather than the inside out. And I think continuing to use the word sensei, continuing to observe the hierarchies is only going to bake in what's already so rancid and disgusting, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't, I, I admire you for writing this book, but I don't think that it's sort of like Trump, you know, his supporters, no matter what facts there are, and there are facts, right? They're not going to, walk away from him and I think it's the same thing and I think it gets tied up in this kind of search for authenticity you know people think in a martial art that you need to get hurt that it's part of training hard and you know I don't agree with that I do believe in training hard I like I trained hard for years but I just think that you know about Chiba, who I knew well. I mean, there is no redemption for a guy like that. There's no redemption. Oops, we lost you. Yeah, I'm back. There's no redemption. And so, you know, I just think what's really important and what I don't hear a lot about is examining our own internalized misogyny until we really get clear about that. And I see you're grappling with it but sometimes it takes an extreme event, like what happened to me. You know, I got expelled from New York Aikikai in the US, I didn't get expelled from the USAF because Yamada knew he couldn't do that. But I quit, of course. And I just think that there's a lot of, I haven't heard people talking about that in the meetings of that I've attended. And I haven't, I just think that, you know, you can tell all the stories you want, just like in therapy, you can talk about all your problems. What does it take to change? And I see you guys perpetuating the hierarchy. And the, the more you do that, the less I believe in, in what you're doing. And I'm just being totally blunt here because I'm tired of it. I'm tired of this sort of, you know, slapping on of, of hierarchy. And then, you know, making excuses like your, your excuse about Chiba. It was his private family life, you know, whatever. He killed a dog. You know, he was a lunatic. So that Biren Kai is propping up a dead lunatic, just like USAF is starting to prop up a dead, demented guy who was a sociopath, a rapist. All of these things I know personally, and I knew Chiba pretty well, too. So. 
what can we do? What am I, what have I been doing in these years that I'm off the mat? Cause I've been off the mat for three years, really looking at myself and my own aversion to training with women in a serious way, because I said they couldn't take it or whatever, you know, my extreme judgmentalism. It's not like I'm, I'm not excluding myself. I want you to understand that. But I do think that Aikido is dying because it deserves to die because it's poorly taught the same old bullshit, you know, bow to the picture of some fascist sexist pig, which is what Osensei was. And, you know, I just, why sugarcoat any of this stuff? Thank and why did I stay? You know, why did I stay? I've had many years to agonize over that. And I think I know why. And let's mention Bruce Bookman. Okay. He's the one that wouldn't let you come to his dojo. And these guys, they don't step up. They don't support us. We need to support ourselves, not deify ourselves or uh, hide in these hierarchical patterns that perpetuate dysfunction. And I'll shut up. Well, I know. I, I agree with a lot of that. And I think, you know, somewhat my role as a journalist, you know, kind of gives me a little bit of an excuse or an, an out in that, you know, I tell the story and I hope the story, you know, and that's the same thing with writing about Trump, writing about any social issues that you try to bring some light to it and um, hope that someone else will take action. But I think as far as internalized misogyny, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm also helping to organize women's camp. That's a great opportunity to work on those issues and talk about those issues. But it's really hard you I, know, to address some fundamental social realities, which are that women are not valued in our culture. And then you, you, you add a layer of that on top of a very hierarchical cult-like organization and, and things get out of, out of, control. you know, there's, there's another issue about um, violence. You know, there are people who do Aikido because they are masochistic and they like getting the shit kicked out of them. And that's just the truth, you know? So how do we build a framework? Ari's been talking about that. Yeah. So the, the agreements that we might have with each other, the safe words we might have with each other, whatever it is. But I still think like, Aikido is a great art. And I've said this to you before, it's an efficient vehicle for self-delusion because we don't have any competition. And if people want to think they're all that, they can. Teaching is pretty bad. I'm sure you're a very good teacher, but I've been to dojos mm -hmm. on the West Coast where it was terrible. And, you know, I just think that I wish you luck. I, I'm more cynical than you are. <laughs> well, Bye. thank you. Um, yeah. Really I'm gonna have to go pretty soon. So yeah. do we have any yeah. soon? Does anybody else want to um, make a, a comment or uh, have a question? Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so Rob, sure. brief. And and this is not necessarily a question. The answer to which will be easy and will fit into the time remaining. But let let us grant all these issues with hierarchy, with particularly male hierarchy, particularly with you know the the power disparity between sensei and student. What does a healthy dojo look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. We just had a whole event about it uh, last week. Um, we should be ready by next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll have more news about that. But yeah, we're trying. I think there are of quite a few very thoughtful people, including Janice, including Ari um, and and um, as well, Claire and other people who are trying to figure out how do we make our dojos more healthy? And I think, again, telling these stories will give us some, you know, here's some negative examples, positive examples. How can we avoid getting into these same um, these same patterns, which I think have, have really hurt a lot of people. And that's one thing that you you I discovered in writing these books is how many people uh, exactly. have been negatively impacted. And, and you know, it's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be um, outliers, but I think we have some very good negative examples but let's put them out there in a, in a more um, objective form. So again, even though I, I do feel strongly that a lot of negative stuff has happened, I'm gonna to try to present these stories pretty straightforwardly and let people judge for themselves. I think, you know, I, again, I think it's main, mainly, uh, mainly uh, educational is my goal to be educational. Oh, I got a, somebody beeping me, so. 
Okay, well, thank you so much, um, very, very, very much. I wanted to ask one more question we didn't get to. I'm wearing my um, cat shirt, which is kind of cool. And uh, I'm a cat lover. Lisa's a huge cat lover. Susan's a cat lover. We uh, trained last night, we afterwards, everyone's cat lover, there we go. And I just wonder if there's something, uh, any messages we have from our, our cats or our cat loving that can help us. <laughs> so maybe we can think about that. Let me sleep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye. Good. Great. Well, thank you, Lisa. Right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. These are, of course, really lively issues. And um, I do just want to say, Lou was here from uh, Slovakia, and I was recently in Western Ukraine. Uh, there are a lot of girls and women training. We need more women, women teachers. The good part of Aikido, I mean, so much health and joy and love and community and networking. Let's not forget some of that stuff and um, the love. The love is super duper important. And, uh, if, and so I think the shift in emphasis is, uh, is extremely important. And we can remember some of those things as we're looking for our ways forward and away from the violence. In the yeah, and Mer Myrna actually had a great um, comment in the chat about a really interesting group in Canada, you know, promoting Aikido for women so and girls. Right. So yeah, we'll, we'll include that in the material, Myrna, uh, when this is presented. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. To be continued. Thank you, Thank Lisa. You. And um, yeah, get get these books. <laughs> yeah, buy my books now. Reading I, and I, writing I, and training and uh, making changes. Thank I you. Made, yeah, it's, it's I'm not getting rich, but it's nice to get a little dollar or two now and then. All right. Thanks, Thank guys. Bye-bye. Yes, good. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.